Well, welcome. So you're halfway or three quarters away through the morning today. So that's wonderful. I hope you've been able to go around and talk to people and get some of your testing done and get your goodie bags full of some nice things. Um, my name is Leanne Redman and I am an assistant professor here at Pennington. Um, I run a program around reproductive endocrinology and women's health. And so somebody just asked me if I had a study in men. Well, I don't, but there are plenty of studies in men at Pennington, but I choose to do my research in women's, in the area of women's health. Um, you might tell that I have an accent. Um, I'm from Australia, but I came here in 2005, just in, in May, just before Katrina. So I've been here quite a while. And um, I did all my training in Australia, and my PhD was in OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology, and also physiology. And I guess my love of things is um, I, I want to learn about how our lifestyle, which now we know is we're sitting still <laughs> more, we're not eating as good foods as we used to. I want to understand how our lifestyle is impacting on women's health. So we do um, run programs in my, um, in my laboratory where we put people on diets or exercise programs and we see that how that can benefit the health of women. So a whole range of topics, pregnancy, gestational diabetes, menopause, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, so lots of, lots of things all around women's health. Um, but today uh, they asked me to talk about gestational diabetes, so I did a few ob learning objectives for us. There's not going to be a test, but just to keep me on track about what we're going to talk about. So we're going to learn what is gestational diabetes. So after this talk, you'll be able to tell people what that is. We're going to learn how common it is, <coughs> not only in the US, but also in Baton Rouge. I've got some information from Women's Hospital. So we'll know what we're dealing with here. We're going to learn what are the risk factors. So what things will put you at a higher risk for developing gestational diabetes. I'm going to try to explain how it's caused. And we'll see how we go how it's diagnosed, or how do you know if you have it? How does gestational diabetes affect the mom, but also the baby? What are the treatments? And what happens after you're not pregnant anymore? So let's get started. So what is gestational diabetes? Does anybody know? Gestational, as the word suggests, is about pregnancy and diabetes, as we know, is about our glucose metabolism. So it makes sense. This is the clinical definition that pregnant women who have never had diabetes before, but who are detected to have high levels of um, sugar in their blood during pregnancy are said to have gestational diabetes. Okay, so these ladies didn't have diabetes before they were pregnant, or they didn't know at least. And then when they get tested during pregnancy, it's the first time you've ever, the doctor's ever seen it, so it's called gestational diabetes. It's also referred to as GDM, because the long name is gestational diabetes mellitus, so GDM. So in my slides today, I'll have GDM just so that I didn't have to write the whole thing out. We can fit more on. So GDM. How common is it? Has everybody known somebody that's had gestational diabetes or you've had gestational diabetes yourself? Everybody nods. It's getting to be more and more common. Okay. So we know that from research studies being done in this country that whether you did the study in New York, Denver, you know, Houston, that if we do a study to look at gestational diabetes in pregnant women, there's going to be about 8% of the ladies that are studied that will have gestational diabetes. And that is about 200,000 pregnant women per year. But the numbers are going up. But the American Diabetes Association, which is really the governing body of diabetes research and education in this country, have developed 
a new way to test for gestational diabetes. It's not been implemented everywhere across the US yet, but there's a big conference going to happen in September this year. And after that, this new test will probably start going into place all around the country. But we know when you do the new diagnostic test, because it's more sensitive, that the numbers are looking a lot worse. So with this new test, because it is more sensitive, it's likely that about 20% of women are going to be shown to have developed gestational diabetes in their pregnancy. So this new test is going to be very important because what that tells us is that with the current diagnosis testing that we have now, like we're missing about 10% of women are going under the radar and so they're not getting treatment and so they're going to have, you know, they could develop um, adverse problems. So what does it look like in Baton Rouge? So we know we have Women's Hospital down the road on airline and we're very, very fortunate to have Women's Hospital here. And it's really unique because 95% of all the babies that are born in our area are born at Women's Hospital. So we can actually learn a lot about the health of women by doing studies on the ladies that come to Women's Hospital. So for example, we, we were able to obtain this information about gestational diabetes. So of all of the babies that were born in 2008, 9, and 10, this is how many of the women had gestational diabetes. So at, on average over the last few years, we don't have 2011 yet, it's about 8%. So it's, it's pretty consistent with what we're seeing across the US. So what are the risk factors for gestational diabetes? What will put you at a higher risk of developing it? There's a few, quite a lot actually. So if you're an older lady, which 35 is an old, but it's older for having a baby, then you have an increased risk of developing gestational diabetes. Probably one of the, um, the highest risk factors though is related to the lady's body weight and body fatness before she gets pregnant. So that's called, um, the way in which we measure our body fatness as a risk factor for diseases is called the body mass index. And you might have had it measured today. And that's really just a ratio of your weight to your height. So it tells us, as doctors and scientists, um, for your height, is your body weight in what we consider to be a healthy range, which means you have a low risk for having metabolic problems? Is your body weight in a moderate range, which means you're overweight, so it increases your risk, or is your body weight obese for your height? So based on this body mass index, we know for gestational diabetes, if the lady's overweight before she gets pregnant, she's about two times more likely to develop gestational diabetes all the way up to if she's severely obese before she gets pregnant, and that means that her body mass index is greater than 35, then she's about eight times more likely to develop it. So we know that our body weight and our shape before we're pregnant is a pretty important risk factor. So the message for that is to try to get in shape before you have the baby, right? We know that if you've had diag um, been diagnosed with GDM in a pregnancy prior to the current one, that that puts you at a higher risk. We also know that a really big risk factor is family history of diabetes. And we want to, what they say is strong family history. And that means having a first degree relative with type 2 diabetes. So that a first degree relative is your mother or your father or your brother or your sister. So that's called a strong um, family history. If you've had been pregnant before, didn't develop gestational diabetes or it wasn't detected with the screening methods that we have, but you had some problems such as um, the baby was born stillborn or um, the baby had some birth defects or simply that the baby was a big baby, nine pounds or greater, then these things tell us that maybe you had gestational diabetes that wasn't detected and it puts you at a higher risk for the next pregnancy. If you have polycystic ovary syndrome, which is in women, um, it's irregular periods, 
it's in hormonal imbalance and it's insulin resistance. We know that that puts you at a higher risk of developing gestational diabetes. And ladies who smoke, now we don't, obviously don't advocate smoking during pregnancy. All women are encouraged to stop, but if the mum does smoke while she's pregnant, she increases her chances by two times for developing gestational diabetes. And we know that being in different ethnic groups can also have a different um, risk factor for developing gestational diabetes. But what does the ethnic diversity look like in our community? So again, we have the information from Women's Hospital and now this is over the last three years. This is from 2008, 2009 and 2010. So in each ethnic group you can see the number of ladies that were diagnosed with gestational diabetes versus the number of ladies that were not. So remember, nationally, when I showed you earlier, it's about 7%. And in Baton Rouge, it was about 8%. And what we don't see here is we don't really have a large ethnic diversity in our community at all. So we don't have, for example, an increased risk in Caucasians because it, it, on average it really is about 8%. So Caucasians look like, or the white people look like they're about 9% and the Asians are a little bit over 10. So, but remember there's so many other risk factors involved. Maybe these ladies are a lot older than these ladies, like there's so many other things to, to tie into it. But really we don't see ethnic diversity. So you're less likely to develop gestational diabetes if you're younger than 25, have a normal body weight for your height before you're pregnant, ethnic group, if you didn't live here obviously because it doesn't seem to be an issue in Baton Rouge, have no, no known diabetes with a first degree relative in your family, and no history of having abnormal blood sugar levels before you were pregnant and no history of having any problems during pregnant, in a prior pregnancy. Now I've just said all these risk factors like what puts you at high risk, what puts you at low risk and what I didn't mention on the last slide is that actually 40 to 60 percent of women that develop gestational diabetes don't have any of those risk factors. So I mean based on the studies we can, we're starting to understand but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get it. Everybody responds differently in pregnancy, essentially. So what causes gestational diabetes or GDM? So we need to understand about diabetes to understand gestational diabetes. So um, diabetes is essentially a metabolic problem to do with blood sugar levels and insulin. Those are the two key things that we need to know. So when we eat food, our blood sugar levels go up, right? And then what happens is our body makes insulin. Insulin comes in the blood and what it does, its job is to take the blood sugar from the blood and put it in other places. It goes to the liver, but mostly it goes into the muscles. And we need it to go there because that's how we use it for energy. That's the job of insulin. When somebody becomes insulin resistant, what it means is that your body's insulin is not doing its job. For whatever reason, it can't take the sugar from the blood and put it in the muscles for energy. So that's what it means when you become insulin resistant. It means you're resistant to the normal action of insulin. So when somebody's insulin resistant, if insulin can't take the sugar out of the blood into the muscles and the liver, what happens to the sugar levels? They go up, right? They continue to rise. So the body's response is make more insulin, make more insulin, make more insulin because my sugar levels are high. So the organ that makes the sugar is called the pancreas and it gets tired. It starts to get tired. It starts to get, to get worn out. So type 2 diabetes used to be a problem that affected people when they were 60 and 70 because just it was a disease of older age and being older because the pancreas gets worn out. But now we're seeing it younger because our diets are providing us with lots of fatty, sugary foods. So our blood sugar levels are high from the foods and they're high for a long period of time. So this is normal insulin resistance. So 
gestational diabetes is when you develop this insulin resistance in pregnancy. So why does that happen? So we know that the growth of the baby is dependent on the mum's sugar levels. Okay, so the normal growth and development of the baby requires sugar, also oxygen. It's transferred from the mum to the baby via the placenta. So sugar mostly comes from the carbohydrates in our diet. And so when the mum is pregnant, the body wants to maximize the amount of nutrition that she's getting out of the foods that she eats. So when the mum eats when she's pregnant, her blood sugar levels increase three to four times above what they normally would before she was pregnant. And they also stay high for a longer period of time. Now that's to deal with the pregnancy so that the baby gets the maximum amount of nutrition so the baby can grow and all these things. Normal, total normal response here. So therefore, if her blood sugar levels are increasing and they're staying high for a longer period of time, then the mom is needing to make more insulin while she's pregnant. So this organ called the pancreas is having to be more active during pregnancy. Okay, seems to be fairly a reasonable concept so far. So this is all normal. But during the second half of pregnancy, the placenta starts to become a very important organ for the baby because the placenta starts to make its own hormones now. So at the beginning, it's the hormones from the mum that are really helping the baby to grow. But after a while, the placenta starts taking over. And we know that some of the hormones that the placenta makes interferes with how the mum's insulin works in her body. So it actually starts to prevent insulin from working properly. So if the mum's insulin isn't working properly, her blood sugar levels can't come down. So they stay high. So therefore, some mums can't make enough insulin to lower their blood sugar levels, so their blood sugar levels stay high for a long period of time. And that's how we diagnose diabetes, right? With looking at our blood sugar levels. So the mum can become insulin resistant. So the causes of gestational diabetes. So gestational diabetes can start when your body is not able to make and use all of the insulin that it needs for pregnancy. And without enough insulin, the blood sugar or the glucose can't leave the blood and be changed to energy for the mom. So the blood sugar builds up in the mom's blood to high levels and that's called hyperglycemia. So really it can happen if the body, if the mom's body isn't making enough insulin or if her body becomes <coughs> resistant to the insulin that she makes. So how do we diagnose it? So diagnosis for gestational diabetes is a two-part process right now. First there's a screening test and then there's the actual diagnostic test. Because it's done in all pregnant women, they wanted to do a quick and sort of cheap way of seeing if women are at high risk first. So that's why they do this two-part process. So they sc we screen all women for gestational diabetes at a certain time in pregnancy because that's the time that we know that the placenta has started to take over as being an active organ for the baby and making these hormones. So we know we need to wait till about 24 weeks before we test for gestational diabetes. But if a mom has had gestational diabetes before or she's in a high risk category, they will screen her very early in her pregnancy in the first trimester because we need to manage it for that mom. So the screening test, everyone can relate to this. Not nice. We got to drink this sugary drink um, in one hour. So you go to the doctor, you drink the drink in five minutes, and then one hour later they measure your blood sugar levels. If your body is working as it should, it should be able to move that sugar that you've drank from your blood into the muscles and the liver so your blood sugar level will be low. But if after one hour your blood sugar levels are still elevated compared to normal, which we have a number here of 130, then you're referred for the proper diagnostic test. So you have to come back. 
And this is called an oral glucose tolerance test, and it's also the test that is used to detect type 2 diabetes. So it's the basis for the diagnosis of GDM, and it's a three-hour test with four blood draws now. The test requires that you drink twice as much sugar in the same period of time, and they will measure your glucose in your blood before you drink the drink, and then at one and two and three hours after you had the drink. So in order to be positive for gestational diabetes, you need to have your blood sugar levels above any of these levels in two times throughout the test. So it's pretty sophisticated. But for the, for the mums that actually have it, it's a real pain in the neck to go for the screening test and then for the other test, which is why the American Diabetes Association are trying to change it. They're proposing to do one test where they've cut the amount of sugar in the middle. So we had a 50 gram sugar for the screening test and 100 grams of sugar for the diagnostic test. They're proposing 75 grams of sugar and a two hour test, but one test for everybody. And if they do that, they're gonna result in a lot more positive tests for gestational diabetes, which means more women can get treatment. So how does it affect the mom and the baby? So let's talk about the maternal risks first. Mums that have gestational diabetes have a higher um, rate of C-section. And that's mainly because, because the baby is getting a lot of sugar and nutrition during the pregnancy, the, the babies grow to be bigger than a, than a, a baby that is, the mum didn't have gestational diabetes. Because of that, they deliver with C-section most of the time so the baby doesn't have problems coming out the birth canal which also will not cause problems for mum. High rate of C-section. Mothers are also have a greater risk for something that's called preeclampsia. And preeclampsia is something serious that develops if the mum is unable to regulate her blood pressure properly during pregnancy. It's called pregnancy-induced hypertension. And the doctor actually monitors preeclampsia or pregnancy-induced hypertension every time you go for a visit. So every time you go for a visit, you provide a urine sample and they're measuring different things in there which give us signs that your body's not dealing well with blood pressure. They also measure your blood pressure as well. So they're checking for that all the time. Mothers with gestational diabetes have an increased chance of delivering their baby preterm, which is prior to 37 weeks of gestation and they have an increased risk of developing gestational diabetes in, in later pregnancies. And that's mainly due to women who have gestational diabetes find it really difficult to lose their baby weight, to get back to their pre-pregnancy weight. And so then if they're bigger for the second pregnancy, that puts them in a higher risk factor category again. And probably one of the most serious things is that ladies who have had gestational diabetes have a far greater chance of developing type 2 diabetes within 5 to 10 years. So if you think that a young mom, she's around 30 or 25 to 30, so by the time she's 40, she could have type 2 diabetes. So that's really, really um, concerning. So we need to help people. Now what about the baby? Um, as I mentioned, that babies that are exposed to large amounts of sugar during the womb can be born bigger. So this, this is the medical term for that, macrosomia, so greater than 4,000 or 9 or 10 pounds. And this means that the baby is at risk for dislocating its shoulder and things like that as it's exiting the birth canal, which is why they choose to do the C-section. The babies are said to be large for gestational age. And the reason they say this other than just this word here is because this weight here would be for a baby that goes full term. But remember I said before that these mums could deliver early. So there's an, an indicator of whether the baby is small for the age at which it was born, appropriate for the age at which it was born, or large. So we know at each week of pregnancy what average weight the baby should be. So these babies born to mums that have gestational diabetes tend to be large no matter what time of pregnancy they're born. The babies um, have a high risk of being jaundiced, which of course requires extra treatment in the hospital. 
um, have high, low blood sugar levels actually when they're born. So they could need to do an IV to give them sugar to help boost their sugar levels. This is all in the baby. But what's important to realize is that gestational diabetes isn't associated with any genetic problems during birth. Like they're two, two totally separate things. But being exposed to these high sugar levels in pregnancy, we know is really important, not only when the baby is in the womb and when the baby is born and big, but being exposed to this kind of environment in pregnancy increases the risks for this person as they grow into childhood and adulthood. So women that gave birth to a gestational diabetic or women that had gestational diabetes and gave birth like 30, 40 years ago, now we know by looking at these adults that the adults had a, gr oh, a greater, um, they had more cases of insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure and obesity. So we're just starting to learn all these things about how important the environment that we were growing our babies is for what happens to somebody 40, 50 years later. So how can we treat it? So similar to um, type 2 diabetes, uh, the treatment is very similar to type 2 diabetes, but what everyone needs to realize, another important thing to take away from here is that it's very important to help the mum to treat her gestational diabetes. It's really not healthy to have really high levels of blood sugar while she's pregnant. I mean, they can treat it with insulin, but the best thing to do is try to get a handle on it yourself with diet and exercise. So the treatments really aim to get the blood sugar levels down uh, after meals and get the blood sugar levels down all throughout the day. So the options for treatment are diabetic counseling to help you change your diet, increase the amount of exercise or activity that you're doing, and at the very last is to use insulin. So if we're talking about diet and exercise, um, it's natural now to talk about body weight. And the weight that a lady gains during pregnancy can actually have a problem for the gestational diabetes. And it can help her to be unable to treat it on her own with changing her diet and exercise. So I, I've got this slide here because I want everybody to know what the recommended amount of weight to gain in pregnancy is. And I don't know if people actually know this because in my experience, I've had two children. I mean, the doctor doesn't tell you how much weight you should gain. They just weigh you every time, and that's about it. So we talked about the body mass index before as being a measure of your weight in relation to your height. So if you have a healthy weight before you're pregnant, the recommendation is to gain between 25 and 35 pounds. But if your body mass index is over 30, which means you're in this category, over 30, then you're recommended to only gain between 11 and 20 pounds during your pregnancy. Let's put this in perspective. How big on average is the baby? Eight pounds. Eight pounds plus the placenta, which is like, if you've seen it, like they, it's huge. Like that's two pounds. Now everyone knows you gain fluid and your breasts get bigger. I mean, this is really not a very large weight gain. So it's a real challenge for the, me like for the medical community and for women to be able to achieve this. So we need to really start thinking about how we can help ladies do that because that's not much weight at all, really. So we can help regulate blood sugar levels with our diet. So we can, and it, it can be successful. So some tips are to limit your calorie intake between 2,000 and 2,500. This is definitely safe for the safe range for pregnant ladies, but in particular, you want to limit the amount of carbohydrate in your diet to about 140 grams a day. We know that insulin resistance is worse in the morning after you've woken up. So in the morning, try to avoid foods that are going to spike your blood sugar levels any processed sugars you want to avoid, um, sugary drinks, even fruit juices that aren't natural are going to spike your blood sugar levels. Have eggs, protein for breakfast. Try to avoid high amounts of carbohydrates at breakfast. 
limiting foods that cause sugar levels to spike, which means that if you do that, you're going to be having more fiber, whole grains in your diet, pasta, brown rice, fruits and vegetables. And a reminder to everybody that knows somebody that's pregnant or is pregnant now, it's very important to take your prenatal vitamin. Very, very important. Um, exercise is interesting for pregnant women because the guidelines actually aren't different whether you're pregnant or if you're not. The Surgeon General recommends, and you've heard this if you went to the talk on exercise, 150 minutes of exercise per week. Now, I don't want you to think of exercise as being walking around the block, going for a jog, going for a swim, riding your bike. We need to start thinking of exercise different. Any calories that you're going to burn when you're up off your backside is very, very important. So for ladies, you know, thinking about all your household chores, all these things are really important for getting you moving. What happens is, remember I told you that most of the glucose or the sugar from your blood goes to your muscles. The muscles act like a pump. So when your muscles are contracting, they act like a pump, which means that the the sugar can go from the blood to the muscle and it needs less insulin to do that. So any kind of movement where your muscles are contracting is very, very helpful for diabetes management. So don't think of it as exercise per se because there's so many exercises that can come into making up this 150 minutes a, a week. That's just on most days of the week. That's a lot of exercise if we did it on most days of the week. It's for the whole week. Okay. Now, if you're unable to control your blood sugar levels within this range, so like less than 180 after a meal, then the doctor may prescribe insulin for you to take. It's completely safe and they'll help you manage that. But it's very important to make sure that you stick to it. Um, we also know that metformin is starting to be prescribed and we're starting to learn that it seems to be safe during pregnancy, not only for the mom, but also for the baby. Metformin does cross the placenta, so that's why they're trying to determine in more studies how it affects the kids as they're growing up. Now, what happens after pregnancy? So people think gestational diabetes, developing it in pregnancy, so then once the baby's born, I should be fine, right? Now, that's the case for some ladies, but we need to realize it's not one shoe fits all feet. So we need to get screened for diabetes or pre-diabetes after the baby's born. And this is starting to be mandated, but it's not being mandated everywhere. And your particular OBGYN may not do it yet. But it's important to ask to be screened after the baby's born because we learned earlier that um, more than half or about half of women that develop gestational diabetes will have type 2 diabetes and that was shown in a, a study that followed them for 28 years. Breastfeeding seems to be really helpful for helping the mom to recover from gestational diabetes because the breast milk is going to contain sugar. It helps to lower the mom's sugar levels so it means it takes the pressure off insulin in the mom's body from doing a lot of hard work. So, um, but breastfeeding is really low in, in Louisiana. Only about 47% of mums that leave women's hospital indicate that they're preparing to breastfeed. So it's a cultural thing. So hopefully we can help encourage mums and women in our families that it's okay to breastfeed at my house. You know, they don't just have to stay home and breastfeed. You know, now we can pump. And so we need to, as women, start talking to our friends and our sisters to say, you know what, this is good for our bodies. We should do this. And breastfeeding actually helps you to return to your pre-pregnancy weight. So after pregnancy, as I said, we want to get screened. So we, we would do that about at your six-week appointment, and it's an oral glucose tolerance test, the same one they do for type 2 diabetes, and with this middle dose or minimum, minimal medium amount of sugar. Um, then it's important to seek diabetes counseling to get your diet on track, get your exercise back on track, and try to get your body weight after baby, which now in a lot of women are gaining 70 pounds, back to where you started. 
So what do we know in our community in terms of after the baby's born? So there's a study that has been done at Women's Hospital where they screen for one year, they screened majority of the ladies that had gestational <coughs> diabetes six to eight weeks after. And then they brought them back after one year to see what they look like. The women that failed the test and that required medication went on medication. But for all those ladies that were at risk but didn't do any treatment, this is what happened. 63% of them that didn't have a medication treatment had some kind of metabolic problem with their blood sugar at one year. That's you know more than half. That's a lot. Almost two-thirds of those ladies who didn't get any help were already on their way to looking like they had more, se more severe metabolic problems at one year later. And what seemed to be common in these ladies is their inability to lose the weight after the baby was born. And in fact, a lot of these ladies gained weight in that first year after the baby was born. So today we learned about what gestational diabetes was, what increases your risks for developing it, what it is, how, what causes it, how we can test for it, how we can treat it, and what's important after the baby's born. So I was just going to tell you really quickly what we're doing here in our Women's Health Program. And Elizabeth Frost is here with me, and she works in the programs that we um, develop. Um, we have um, three exciting studies that are happening now, and we also have another one that's going to start in, in the fall. So um, I'll say, start with this one on the gestational diabetes. The people at Women's Hospital, they came to us after they saw that information that two-thirds of these ladies after they have their baby are going on to develop more severe metabolic problems. So we said, we need to do something for women in our community. So we decided to develop a diabetes prevention program. So the ladies can get screened by their doctors six to eight weeks after. If they need medicine, they go and do that. If they don't require medicine, then we're putting them on a personalized diabetes program, diabetes prevention program. So we're tailoring their diet, helping them with exercise, mm -hmm. And they can do that either by coming to Pennington and having weekly meetings with a counsellor who helps them, or because we decided that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a young mom, it's impossible. Getting a young mom to come for appointments every week when the baby's not sleeping, the mom's very tired, she might have to go back to work. I'm like, that's not going to work for people. So we tried to be innovative and we came up with an idea that we should start doing this by the telephone. So we have a group of trained diabetic counsellors that can do the entire program with the mums over the phone. So they contact the mums every week at a time that they decide, and they do everything by the telephone. So we're trying to bring our programs to women in their own homes and in their own environment. So we're really excited about that because we actually developed that based on a need that's happening in our community. We also have a program in... Um, for ladies who have polycystic ovary syndrome. It's the most common reproductive problem in young ladies and it's actually um, a cause of infertility. These ladies are insulin resistant and they um, generally seem to be overweight and obese and they have problems gain losing weight actually. So we're again trying out different programs to help these ladies get their periods back and to ovulate on their own, to see if they can become pregnant on their own. So we're, we're testing women already on that. Um, we also have a study for women who are insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. We know that different foods that we eat are particularly important for helping to reduce our risk of insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. One is blueberries, and there's somebody out, out there, April, Dr. Stull is talking about blueberries today. But we also know that cinnamon is very, very important. And there's an active component in cinnamon that actually helps take the glucose or the sugar from the blood into the muscles. And so we're doing a study where we will ask ladies who are pre-diabetic or even if they're on metformin to temporarily discontinue their medications and to try cinnamon. And so they'll work with the physicians here to incorporate cinnamon, the, act, act, the active component of the cinnamon it's in a little capsule at breakfast and lunch and dinner. And we'll do it for a period of three months to see 
how you respond and how your blood sugar levels go. But one of the most exciting things that we've got is coming up in the fall. Um, myself and a team of people at Women's Hospital, we got a three and a half million dollar project funded by the National Institutes of Health. And the program is designed to help women gain these recommended amount of weight in pregnancy. And very similar to what I just described with not being able to come for appointments and all this stuff. You know, when you're pregnant, you've got to go once a month, then once every two weeks, and then once a week, and you're just like overloaded. And so now we're going to say, come and do a program with us. Come once a week. Mm -mm, not going to happen. So what we decided to do was think of a way to bring our program to people without coming into our center. So we're going to do the whole program in a group of women through their cell phones. It's really cool. So the ladies will get a bathroom scale that has a little chip in it. And when you stand on the scale in the morning, it sends your weight through your phone to our computers. So we know every single day what you weigh. And so for each lady, we're going to make them a, a, a chart of their weight. So every day they stand on the scale and they get their weight. Then through their telephone, we'll send them a chart of their body weight. And if they're above where they should be or below where they should be, we can give them little pointers for the week. You need to eat more of this, do that, do exercise or whatever. So we're going to be able to tailor the weight management program to every single lady through their cell phone. It kind of sounds like voodoo, but I mean, everybody has a cell phone these days or iPads or whatever. So we can bring medicine and health to people rather than asking people to come to us for medicine and health. Everyone's time is so demanded these days for everything that there's just not enough time. So we need to start being more innovative in the way in which we think to help people. Okay. So that's all. <laughs>